Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Oni's Onyabo Raising Project. We're today working on uh, Chapter 7 of Feather Sharp as Knives. If you haven't checked out the previous videos, uh, go check that out. I'll uh, put uh, one of the uh, little card up here in the videos so you can see it. And yeah, be able to check up on the story so far. Uh, so quick one. This is a story by one of my clients, Christina. She's releasing this in May. And super excited. It's a uh, Venetian, when I say Venetian, yeah, like Venice based uh, Italian uh, fantasy series. So please uh, feel free to subscribe and like if you like the videos, as we'll be our, we will be alternating these videos with episodes of The Girl and the Beast and other entries that people put in and submit for uh, daily feedback, which I'll be reading. I put those along with uh, these entries that I do just so that everybody can keep up to date, but also that we can learn and analyze our writing. So if you find this helpful and you want to keep learning more about some writing techniques that we see in real time, please like and subscribe so you can learn more and let's get into it. So today uh, it's a new chapter and we're actually going back to our main character, Amelda here. So it's been a long time coming. And let's start at chapter seven of Feather Sharp as Knives. So Amelda wound her freshly spun spool wool corn to Kanto onto the nitty knotty, focusing on the repetitive circles in an attempt to ignore the flurry of packing around her, the slam of trunks and the rustling of dresses. Edita, her maid, stepped in front of Amelda holding an armful of dresses. She was even shorter than Amelda. Her hair was pulled into a tight bun at the nape of her neck with gray streaks at her temple. Siora May, please, you need to choose. I can't do it for you. What Amelda needed was to spin as much corn tanto for the wings as she could in the next few weeks. She pulled the corn tanto off the nitty knotty, walked over to her wash basin and dunked the thread in the water. You can choose, Edita. I trust you. Edita pressed her lips together. Amelda knew she disliked Amelda using the wash basin for corn tanto. We'll bring your winter and early spring dresses and your mother's portrait. Perfect. Thank you. Of course, yeah, May. I'll wrap the portrait myself. Edita waved other students over to command to give them commands. Arturo wandered in, munching on cheese. Still packing? You're done? He shrugged. I have less junk than you. Amelda held up the looped corn canto. I have been preoccupied. She put the thread back in the water. He smiled. That's a beautiful sight. Silk? Wool. Ooh, we got it right in there. Well, let's say Wool. I'll do some silk tonight. Downstairs, someone knocked on the door. Amelda held in a sigh. Tell them to run away. Tell them to go away. She pulled the corn canto out of the water and wrung it out. Red tinted water splashed onto the floor. Ugh, the details of blood. Gnarly. Edita hurried over to wipe the spill from her ape and then excused herself. They're just being polite. They're just being polite, Arturo said. Each family has to send its condolences. Every visit reminds me again that he's gone. Since Opa's death, Three days before, Amelda and Arturo had entertained a steady stream of guests. They all brought wine or blood oranges or loaves of bread, generous gifts all, but none would bring their father, bring her father back. I'll tell them you're sick, he said. Grassy, the house steward entered. Lieutenant Alsama Arai is here, Sior and Sior Eme. Arturo dismissed the manservant and turned to Amelda. Did Anselmo tell you he was coming? Of, of course not. Did he tell you? No, I haven't written him in a while. Amelda hung the wound corn conto on the iron hook by the fire and gave it a tug. Now he knows how I felt. Not exactly the same, I'm sure. Arturo was wrong about that. He glanced at the door. Would you like me to tell him you're sick? I understand if you don't want to see him. Because of Opa? or because he didn't write me, or because of our past, or because I'm already engaged. Engaged. She'd said the word too easily for how much she hated the idea. 
not the idea, the fact. The fact that she was engaged before she even got to talk to Anselmo after their four years apart. It's a long time, man. All of them, I imagine. You don't have to, all of them, I imagined. You don't have to see him. You don't owe him anything. I think a prompt that Arturo speaking here would be nice. But Imelda owed it to herself. She needed to know. She'd spent nearly every day of her life with Anselmo, and then nothing for four years when he left for Zorzi. Oh, wow, they were, like, tied at the hip. Okay. Even if the wings had failed, even if the wings failed and she married the god's awful king, she had to know how Anselmo felt. How does he feel? She tugged on the loop of thread. I want to see him. She turned around. Because we're making... Because of... The wings, Arturo smiled. She couldn't let herself say it aloud, give voice to her hope. Not with connected to not with it connected to Anselmo, but Arturo could say it for her. She couldn't help but smile back, a small one, but genuine all the same. I'll tell him you'll be right around. You'll be right down. Arturo left. Imelda rang the bell for Edita, then turned to her bed. The maid hadn't packed all the dresses yet. She pulled out a deep plum one made of silk that draped like lines over the side of a galley. As Edita tied a silver belt around the high waist, Imelda combed her hands through her hair and pulled it over one shoulder. Okay, so one thing I want to say, this is really cool, is the author here is building anticipation, right? So you know the weight of their relationship, not only with the preamble that was building up to it, but even now when she's making him wait and coming on to, this is giving weight to the to the relationship. There's so many times we'll just see something just happen and there's all this emotional weight and this baggage that comes with it. And you're trying to catch up and get the weight of the conversation or the relationship while the interaction is happening. But here she's building anticipation for their meeting up as right before they're coming down. So she's taking her time, you know, with our true knowing with her taking down, you're seeing the way uh, Imelda is getting re ready. You, She's already putting up that Anselmo and her are heavy. And it's not just, oh, hey, we had a thing, blah, blah, blah. There is that. But you see it in her actions. You see it in how much time the author is taking to get to it. This is how you build anticipation. And this is really important when you're going to have something heavy or something fairly monumental to the story happen, or you're trying to show the audience something important and so this is a really cool element right here as edita tied a silver belt around the high waist imelda combed her hands through her hair and pulled it over one shoulder she walked down the stairs and paused outside the salon the door muffled arturo's and anselmo's voices but she could tell whose they were arturo's was a tenor a skipping staccato as he followed his thoughts and somehow answered in a restrained resonant baritone Four years with no word from him, and now she was going to see him, days after her father's funeral. The day after Primo told her she was engagement. She was engaged? About her engagement. You know, that's something to look through. But just hearing that voice a bit deeper than before, but still unmistakably on Salmos, brought back memories of their time together as friends, and then more than friends, much more. No more dawdling, she smoothed her hair, took a deep breath, and entered. Anselmo snapped to his feet. He wore his gray-blue uniform, one line of silver on his shoulder indicating the rank of lieutenant. Someone had finally recognized his skill and promoted him. His clothes were clean, and with his crisp posture, he looked the part of the heroic soldier. But his eyes had grown tight from the things he'd seen, the things he'd done these last four years at war. Gone was the boy she'd known the boy she loved. Instead, a man stood in his place, handsome and tall, and so very grown up. You're huge, she blurted. She then slapped her hands over her mouth, causing a popping sound that made Anselmo chuckle. Despite his deep voice, it was a quiet sound. I'm sorry, he said. No, I mean, you look good. Anselmo laughed again, and Imelda felt herself blush. To hide it, she pulled him in to kiss cheeks. His hands rested on her shoulders as they greeted. His face was earnest but gave nothing away, and he wouldn't, not with Arturo here. 
And Samo's been telling me about Zorsi, Achiro said. How was it? she asked. And Samo rubbed his beard. I survived. I'm so glad you did. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. She twirled her hair around a finger and forced her breathing to remain slow. He smiled as if despite himself, and there he was, her on Samo. Under those military blues and weary look, he was still there. Renze and Dante are gone, he asked. To the south on some quest or other. We sent them word of Opa's death, but haven't heard back, Imelda said. It's been several months since their last hemp message. There hasn't been a written letter. Hemp message? What's that? It's interesting. I'm sure they're fine. Yes, I'm sure. She smoothed her skirt, resisted the urge to play with her hair. It was almost too much to look at him. He was so much more since she'd last seen him. It created an ache within her, though not entirely unpleasant. Arturo cleared his throat. I need to keep packing, he said. Imelda glanced at him, and he waved his fingers by his side to acknowledge the lie. Gods, he was the best. Good to see you, Anselmo. Packing? Anselmo asked. Arturo smirked. Primo's orders. Imelda will tell you about will tell you about it. I prefer all about it. Anselmo gave her a questioning look as Arturo left. We're moving into Palazzo Dogal for a while, she said. A short while. They were finally alone. Where to begin? Stay for dinner. What would you like? I think the kitchen is empty, but I'll send a servant out. Primo probably expected them by then, but she didn't care. He might be able to force her to move in, but she'd take her sweet time doing it. I have golf patrol tonight, unfortunately, Anselmo said. I actually came to ask if you'd like to go for a walk, but if you're busy... A walk sounds lovely. She took his arm before he even offered it. His coat was wool, and underneath he was strong and steady. He'd grown taller in the last years, and yet she never felt small around him. It was right being so close to him. It was also different than before. It felt new in a way. A new sense of his proximity, a new warmth, a new desire to be even closer. Oh my golly, this girl likes this dude. I don't know how I'm handling this. She pulled herself snug against his side. He looked at her in surprise, then placed his free hand on her arm, though his posture remained stiff. What? she asked. Has she been too presumptuous? The lottery is today. And that's where you're going, he nodded. And you've entered your name, she said slowly. I have. She gripped at her hair with her free hand. Why? Why didn't you listen to me? All those years you... Why didn't you listen to me? All those years you lectured me. Told you, Anselmo. I told you how dangerous it is. You think I don't know? The rumors in the navies are unimaginable. Soldiers who die, soldiers who come back worse than dead, maimed and unable to fight, or make any kind of living for themselves other than begging. But I'm better than them, and I have to take any chance I get. His, slant have, his hand slipped off of hers. Do you still want to go with me? She led him toward the door. If it's important to you, it's important to me. On the street, lit litters bustled around pedestrians in the afternoon sun, and some who joined the river of people. This, by the way, she is not happy about something. Now, uh, I've been, I think I'm a little privy to what's going on, but let's see if we can uh, pick it up here, because I don't know if the author's mentioned it yet. So let's uh, get clear on what this lottery is all about. I'm sorry about your father, he said quietly. He was a good man, always treated my mother and me with kindness. Imelda took a long, shuddering breath and ignored the prickling in her eyes. Grassy. But I'd rather not talk about it. Everything was in limbo for the last year, and I just want to remember how to live again. He covered her hand, squeezing it gently. It was tempting, so tempting to lay her head against his shoulder. Ugh. But it wasn't Carnival yet. So some more is still held. Prino would undoubtedly hear about this, and he'd have plenty to say on the subject. In fact, she shouldn't even have her arm through his. With a reluctance that was almost painful, she pulled herself free. Oh my gosh. It's a good detail. This is good world building. 
see this is really good so this is where you're pulling out details of the character right so you could just have her pull her arm out and then we could ascertain why but the way she's explaining it out so think about this if they were just any sort of random people this wouldn't matter right but the fact that the author isn't has included this and this says something about her little fight already here you're feeling her pain as you make these decisions it's these little things where you you test a character's metal right because right now you see she and him have a deep connection and they have a need to fulfill that connection right but literally in order to fulfill her other need which is certainty right and she has a certainty to gain freedom as well as you know not spoil her life she has to sacrifice her need of connection and you see an example of it just right here and it's just in this small gesture gesture and so making sure you put little things like this that sort of allude to the the overall theme and conflict of your character like these are sort of microcosms of the theme because obviously a big part of this story is going to be her choosing between uh the rules of her society what Primo the Doge has said, and her love for Anselmo, right? And the author's done really good, you know, buttering us up so that we know that. And so you see these little microcosms of behavior where you see this battle within her. This is what creates tension within the scene, even though it's just them walking down a street. Like, not much has happened yet. It's just them walking yet. We're already so involved with this and we're getting really involved with Imelda because we're seeing the little things that are going on in her head and we're seeing why she's having to do it. So this is where the setting, which is the expectations and the atmosphere, as well as the time period and the character's set place, is coming into clashing with the character's needs. And so we see her go from sort of this high vibrational resonance and feeling and start dropping down into some fear and some reluctance because once again the setting and her character needs are in cla are clashing and so this is a really good example of microcosm and there's lots of little examples of this but i really wanted to highlight this example of where just keeping her hand her arm in his arm is a social norm that's breaking rules and there's this little rebel inside of her that's coming out making these wings trying to go against it but you still see that ultimately even inside of her own mind, these social mores still hold strong. And this tells us a lot about our character. So as we, it's these little gestures that as we place them throughout a book, we'll be able to say, okay, when she's presented with this next circumstance, like maybe later on, she has the opportunity to see him in public and then she wildly kisses him. This is where you see a wild juxtaposition and the progress of her character. I don't know. I'm just assuming that's an example of some progress that can be had. Or maybe, you know, something happens and then she doesn't even question it at all. But it's these little microcosms of behaviors that illuminate the needs and the character's behavior and the character's arcs. And it's really important to have little things like this because it what creates conflict within the scene without having to have shit blow up. And this is really cool. So this is a good idea. This is good stuff. He stiffened even more, which seemed impossible. I'm sorry, was that too forward? No, please don't apologize. I, her voice broke. Damn that they had to be in public. She spoke quieter. I missed you so much, but Primo. He's head of the family now that your father is dead. And you know how he is. With a long inhale, Anselmo nodded. He'd never prove, which is why I have to go into the labyrinth. His tone lifted at the end, and he gave her a hopeful look. Oh, gods, she could tell him about her engagement. She should tell him about her engagement, but she couldn't. Not with that look. She had seen it so many times before he, when he spoke about the labyrinth. See, this is really cool stuff, right? Guys, like, this is really cool because this conversation has so many little conflicts because she's making character decisions. And you guys might think, Okay, well, that's whatever. But no, seriously, you won't believe how many books don't have this kind of stuff. And recognizing it's these type of little things like choosing to tell him about things or not, knowing that she should and shouldn't, and just literally saying it, having that go through her head and react to his tone. Like that, because the thing is, if we had just crossed and moved forward with this dialogue, 
you would never have thought, okay, there's something missing. But it's the fact that she points out, the author says, hey, Imelda wants to say this and didn't. So now the absence of something she has said has created tension within the character. It's that absence. It's the thing that wasn't spoken that's creating conflict, not the things that were said. So this is where using, I would like you can call it negative space or just making sure that when people read through things, that the obvious things come to light and that even if they don't come to light, that they're addressed. Because sometimes by addressing something, but not directly uh, implementing it, you create a point of conflict. And that gives you a point of a conflict resolution that you can have later on down the line. And so here she's choosing, uh, probably shouldn't tell him about the labyrinth or about the engagement, even though this dude's going into the labyrinth so that he they can be together so he can become noble, I guess, because they're going into the labyrinth. That's crazy, right? And so already there's a lot of juicy tension here. And this is just a simple scene of two lovers meeting after a long time. And this is already there's already a ton of conflict showing up. This is this is good. This is really good. Oh God. They crossed El Ponte Grando. Sunlight danced on the waters of El Can Canalasso, and boats slid across the surface. A rainbow of houses lined the canal, bold as spring in the brightness of the day. The chant of galley rowers below mixed with the cry of seagulls overhead. The streets grew more and crow more crowded as they made their way across Centro. A buzz was in the air, everyone chattering to their neighbor. People of the lower classes barely flinched as a cold gust whistled from the north. Carnivale was coming, bringing the end of both the winter and the year. Servants carried armfuls of fabric for new dresses for their siore and coats for the siori. A young man pushed a cart full of mass-making supplies. Father, feathers, jewels, paint, and paper. He wore the embroidered vest of an apprentice mascara. Mas mascara. 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 Oh my gosh, I'm terrible. A lady's maid bumped into Imelda with a basket full of ribbons. She bobbed her head, murmured her apologies, and hurried away. Okay, so that's the first half of chapter seven of Anselmo and Imelda meeting up. This is really cool. There's some really juicy, juicy points um, of like sort of microcosmic uh conflict and this is a really good example this is a re like this is really cool because this is how you can create conflict in a scene where the characters aren't fighting right but it's all internal stuff that's happening with imelda and we see how it doesn't go into this long granted diatribe like the she's very good about having us have character interaction having that come into conflict with the setting and the overall mood of the story and the environment then doing some descriptions and moving the action. And it's this small, slow rhythm as she builds the scene up, right? And you see this pattern throughout the entire writing. And so this is something that if you want to stay compelling, especially as you're building character, um, you, you have to just stay, give a little bit, but then always move forward and make sure you sort of just do this small focus on character, setting, premise move forward character setting premise move forward and just every little little microcosmic instance and then overall if you can do that in the small little bits of paragraphs and sentences throughout the work then eventually you build a scene and then if you do that with enough of your scenes then you build you know a section and then you know you have a story and you you got the whole story done so this is an excellent job of uh doing that and so i'm I'm super pumped. I'm super pumped about this, guys. You should definitely check out uh, chapter two or the second part of chapter seven as we get into this. Now, if you like this and you found this useful, uh, like and subscribe so you can see more little hints and keep up with Christina's uh, Feather Sharp of Knives, right? Uh, look forward to it. And guys, look forward to seeing you later. And I need to keep my... I'm terrible at this. Watch it. So, guys, thanks so much for checking it out. Uh, keep writing. You're the authors of your own story. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Peace.